Uh, these electrodes have a okay have a fixed size. Uh, for simplicity's sake, let's assume that the distance of the electrodes from each other is the same or about one. Next slide. Your conductivity uh, cell, therefore, is a one. And you'd use different self constants for different measurements. Uh, a 0.01 might be uh, used for 0 to 2 microsiemens. Uh, a 0.1 might be used for 0 to 200 microsiemens. Next slide. A self constant of 10. And, uh, like for each plate and the distance between them would give you a cell constant of not 10, but 0.10. So the bigger the cell, the, the smaller the amount of conductivity that, we, that is measured. Other cell constants are 0 0.01, uh, 0 .10, 0 0.1. Uh, there's, there, on the market, there are some 0.5s and some 5s also. Next slide. In your toroidal conductivity is the other way of measuring conductivity. It's generally used for high conductivity or dirty solutions where you can't use uh, the contacting type. Next slide. And you basically have two toroids, uh, one on the left and one on the right. Uh, an inductive magnetic field uh, operates on the different principle than the cells that we were talking about. This is what's called electrodeless conductivity. Go ahead. Next slide. During operation, the cell is immersed entirely in the process uh, liquid. Uh, the instrument sends an alternating current known uh, value through one of the coils, the primary toroid. This current creates a magnetic field and, in, and induces a current in the process liquid. The current in turn induces the current in the pickup coil. Next slide. So you're basically sending conductivity from the left side to the right side, measuring the conductivity and going back to your analyzer again. Next slide. It's ideal for corrosive or uh, and high conductivity applications. It's also very good in dirty and and, uh, and fouling applications that would foul up a contact in conductivity. Next slide. Uh, calibration is a means to, to check both the conductivity measurement uh, for proper calibration. The calibration can be done two ways, and we're pretty well wrapped up here. Uh, if you want to check your instrument, if you're using a UDA or an APT and you just simply want to check your instrument make sure it's reading correctly, you simply use a resistor and then take a look at the reciprocal value. Let's say you want to use a 10K uh, resistor. If you put a 10K resistor on a analyzer, it should read 10 microsiemens. If you use a 1K resistor, it ought to read about 1,000 uh, uh, microsiemens. If you know the instrument's working right, then the next thing to do is to attach your cell to the analyzer and then use a known solution, almost like a buffer, and get a 25 um, microsiemen solution and, it, and look at the entire system. And you can adjust it just like you do PA. Next slide. Okay, so electronically, use a resistor for the grab sample, use a standard solution of some known value. It's very difficult in a power plant, though, to use something less than 10 microsiemens or 15 microsiemens solution. If you do, the minute you open that cap, you contaminate it with CO2 and what's in the air, and that sample is no longer uh, good to use. Uh, so you should use something higher than those very low bottles of conductivity solution. Next slide. Uh, that's just a, a picture of the contacting conductivity. The flow comes in through the uh, right and through the unit comes out through the hole in the left. Therefore, the water is passing by both of those uh, positive and negative uh, plates. Next slide. Uh, this should be one of the last ones. This is the toroidal conductivity. Uh, you've got brown, uh, well, you've got peak, Teflon, PVDF and polypropylene, and you would select those to go with your application, whichever one is most compatible. Go ahead, next slide. And that wraps up the presentation. We'll open it now for questions. Uh, and again, we thank you for spending time with us. And sorry for the problems that we started with at the beginning, and because of that, we've run over a little bit. But we'll open things up to questions, and Jennifer? Uh, yes, thank you guys. Um, so at this time I would like to read some of the questions that came through the chat. 
Um, we did get quite a few questions asking if the presentation will be available at a, at a later date. And um, it, it, we actually did record, um, record the entire presentation, and it will be up on our website, industrialcontrolsonline.com. And it will be under the, the training section. Um, so within the next couple of days, we will email a link to the video and our contact information um, if you have any further questions. Okay, so um, we received a question from Abdul. Um, what is Nurshin effect? Okay, uh, the actual pH measurement, the electronic pH measurement, uh, was developed by, uh, I don't, don't know what his first name was, but his name was Nernst. I assume by that that he's probably German. And he came up with the Nernst equation, and it's got, I can probably get you that. I don't have it part of this presentation. But it's the actual uh, calibration used to measure pH and to generate the millivoltage uh, and the correct millivoltage. And part of the Nernst equation, um, I could, if, if he can get me his email address through you, Jennifer, I'll send him what the Nernst equation looks like. But part of the Nernst equation, most of them are constants, but the, but the one that does vary would be temperature and the temperature will change pH. And basically what the Nernst equation is guaranteeing is the pH that you're measuring at that temperature is reading correctly. I've done some training uh, where we've actually calibrated a pH probe in front of an audience. And I'll, uh, and I'll get a cup of coffee out of the urn first thing in the morning before we start. And it generally takes us about an hour and a half to get to the section on temperature compensation. And I'll pour another cup of coffee from the urn and I'll put them on the table, and I'll ask the audience, uh, is the pH in both, of those, in both of those cups of coffee the same? And th the answer to that is no. There'll be different pH values. Same cup of co same coffee, same source, two different temperatures, two different pHs. And what the Nernst equation does, it says the pH in the cooler water that it reads, let's say it's reading 4.3, uh, that pH is correct at that temperature. Uh, the other one where the coffee is hotter would probably be about 4.7. And in that case, what the Nernst equation is saying is at that temperature, that 4.7 is corrected for temperature. So that's what the Nernst equation really does. Okay. Um, we received another question through the chat from Michael. Is it true you can repair the DuraFet pH probe? I don't like the word repair. It can be refilled. Uh, it's about the only pH probe that I would refill in the, uh, on the market. Uh, as I said before, the potassium chloride's job is to leach out. So it empties kind of like a fountain pen. The more you use it, a fountain pen, listen to me, ballpoint pen, um, as you use it, you use uh, more and more ink, and there's less and less ink available. So the DuraFet can be recharged, as some people call it, refilled. Uh, I'd prefer that you don't wait until the probe is, is empty because under some pressure, as the potassium chloride exits the, uh, as the potassium chloride exits the reference electrode cavity, you can get process up in there, and the process can attack the silver-silver wire. So what I'd like to do is uh, if it's under high flow, high temperature, just check the probe occasionally. Maybe when you take it out and clean it, open it up and check it. And if it needs more, you can tap it. Uh, and if it needs more potassium chloride, I find that the DuraFed will last longer and work better being refilled if you do it occasionally instead of waiting until it's empty. Okay. 